happy to get going if we want to go ahead and take our seats. We're good to go, I think. Hi, Jim. Good to see everybody. Hey, Clyde, could you do me a favor and get the door, please? Thank you. How is everybody doing? Amen. Good. Praise God. All right. Go ahead and uh, just just real quick, a couple of housekeeping things real quick. I just want to let everybody know the our little handout outline for tonight. I've got a couple little typos on it. Um, if you go to the second page, the last two major points... Um, that read um, the condemnation of Ephesus and the conclusion of Ephesus. It should read chapter 2 and not chapter 3. Okay. One small minor typo, I think, is the only one for tonight. Again, what we've done or what we're doing is give you basically a kind of a little synopsized version of my notes uh, and then some blanks so that you can kind of follow along and fill those things in so it kind of helps keep you a little bit engaged in what we're laying out and what we're teaching. So um, it's a whole new um, phase in our study beginning tonight, uh, as we, as you will see. Last week, as you all know, we did a kind of a broad overview of what we refer to as the church age, the age of grace. Again, we're going to just share some thoughts tonight about how and where that shows up within the context and the structure of the book of Revelation. Um, and then we're going to spend the next several well, next several weeks, um, I don't know, there's seven churches that we're going to be looking at specifically. This could go into um, nine or ten weeks depending on, um, on the depth of some of the churches that we really need to focus on or look at. Because uh, this, this chapter is so loaded and it's so important um, for everybody in this room to understand the significance of chapters two and three because it affects us. Um, it's where we find ourselves um, prophetically, doctrinally within the scope of the, of the book of Revelation and uh, within the context of the word of God. And my hope and my prayer that as we uh, unpack these verses, these seven churches over the next few weeks, that um, um, it'll shed some light, not just from a timeline or time schedule or prophetic clock perspective, but also some really practical things that I want us to, uh, to consider. Those of you that have been here a while, I'm just real quick. Um, if you look at your little How to Study the Bible booklet, which is part of your major notebook, uh, page number three has the principles of Bible study. The one principle that we will be really looking at um, quite a bit in the coming weeks is principle number four, the three applications of Scripture. Because it's really important that we understand how that principle applies to the church age specifically, um, especially the church age, because um, because of its historical implications. I don't think I have to tell you, those of you that have been here a while, know where we stand prophetically. We believe that we're in the last phase, the last part generally of the church age, with the last church, Laodicea, being mentioned in uh, chapters 3, verses 4 through 22. Um, and um, right after that church comes to a close, um, there's going to be a trumpet sound. The words come up hither, and my goodness, we will be, uh, we will be out of here. How and when that happens, um, only the Lord knows. Uh, but I do believe this, it's imminent, and I believe it's a lot closer than what we think. And uh, what we'll be doing, not just as part of our study here uh, in the book of Revelation, we're going to be hearing extensively of that event, the rapture of the church, um, as it comes to a, a close, um, in a couple of weeks. Um, what's the first Sunday in June? Somebody remind me real quick. Is it the third? It's the fourth. Fourth. On June 4th, we will be looking at that event in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I'm so excited about 
about um, laying that particular part of our study in Thessalonians out on a Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different perspectives, a lot of schools of thought, a lot of opinions about that event. Um, we'll be sharing some thoughts about uh, why it's become such a controversial issue, um, especially in recent years, and I'm not surprised. Uh, but um, I'll tell you what, I wake up each and every day hoping and praying that today's the day. But if not, we're going to occupy till he comes. We're going to stay true and stay focused on what he's called us to do and and um, what our mission is. And um, those of you that are around here quite a bit, you know what that is, right? We just want to see lost people come to Christ. And those that have come to Christ, we want to see them grow in his grace. And we call that discipleship. And uh, this evening, as we look at the Church of Ephesus specifically, um, we'll go back into that book just a little bit, just just extract a few verses and passages that reveal so much to us about why Paul chose um, the church at Ephesus to lay the foundation, if you will, to begin what we would refer to as the church age. Um, God does everything with a purpose and for a purpose, and uh, um it's, uh, as you'll see here tonight, there's a reason why he chose this particular church to, um, to begin this amazing period that we know as uh, the church age. With that said, um, let's have a word of prayer and um, we will get right into our study tonight. Father, we thank you so much for tonight, Lord, for our time together, Lord, around your word. And I just pray that as we um, look at these... Um, these verses about the Ephesian church, Lord, and its significance in church history, um, that you would just open our hearts and our minds to its purpose and what it means and what it represents and what we should be about as well. Um, Lord, I'm just so grateful. We're privileged in this room to be a part of this age, this, what you would refer to in your word as a dispensation. And um, Lord, I just pray that um, we would, um, we wouldn't take it for granted, your grace your mercy and your love, but we would um, take to heart um, the way this church responded. But Lord, just like us, we tend to get distracted oftentimes. And uh, as we'll see here in the, in the text, Lord, oftentimes lose our first love. Um, but Lord, we come to you tonight and just ask you that if we've wandered or if we've, um, if we've strayed just a bit, Lord, that you just bring us back, that we would, as your word reveals to us, remember what you did for us repent, Lord, and, uh, and return. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, uh, you have your way in our hearts tonight. We'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everyone, go ahead and uh, turn to chapter number two. Again, we're going to be launching this whole new section tonight. Um, everybody that's been here for the beginning of our study and even looking back at some of the things that we covered last fall when we were looking at the signs of the times, Matthew chapter 24 specifically, or the, all, what we refer to oftentimes as the Olivet's Discourse, Jesus preparing his disciples, preparing the world for his return, um, gives us a series of sign. I think we covered signs. I think we covered 10 of them. And um, tonight we are going to be looking at the um, or actually not tonight, but in this book, the book of Revelation, the actual, um, the actual events, right? The actual occurrences of everything that Jesus uh, wrote about, spoke about in the 24th chapter of Matthew. So if you're curious or if you want a, a good foundation in terms of actually getting into this book um, and you've got some spare time, not that everybody in this room has spare time, but... Uh, Go back to that study in the 24th chapter to kind of get a, a perspective because that'll help you prepare from a um, kind of a bigger bigger picture, uh, kind of a, a, a broader perspective on the signs of the times. Um, again, uh, we're going to be a very important part of the book of Revelation beginning tonight. And it begins in chapter number 2. Um, as you will see, we're going to be looking at seven verses. These are the seven verses in the first, in the second chapter of the um, book of Revelation that focus and deal specifically with the, um, with the church of Ephesus or the Ephesian church. 
Um, again, just by way of review real quick, um, I want to remind you, and you're going to see it again tonight, not just in some of our charts, but also in the text, that you are, we are living in the church age. You know, most people have no concept or realize that as Christians, what we have tried to do is give you the bigger, broader perspective to God's word, never lose sight of the larger context, which is nothing more, as you very well know, than a battle for a kingdom and a throne. That is the premise, that is the theme of the Bible, and uh, that battle rages to this day. Now, God has dealt differently with different groups of people. Principle number two in your little booklet um, the three groups of people are the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. And what God has done, as we saw last week, he also established a system, a structure called time. Uh, time as we know it is how God chose to put together um, a couple timelines that are revealed to us in his word in terms of how he's going to um, bring restoration uh, to his kingdom. As you all know, that kingdom, um, which is based on the theme of God's word, is lost in the Old Testament. And I say that from a couple of perspectives. It's lost in a positional kind of way, way back in eternity past, when, Le uh, when Lucifer, uh, an archangel, leads, a, a, I'm sorry, a cherub, uh, leads a mutiny, a rebellion against God. And what God begins to do in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, he begins to restructure and put together not just a timeline or a plan, um, but he explicitly creates men and women for the first time so that his kingdom can be restored. You find that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28, where he creates Adam and Eve. He gives them a commission, be fruitful, multiply, and are you ready for this term? For the, and replenish. I think we all know what the word replenish means, right? So he's doing that because earth has always played a significant role and plan in God's kingdom. That being said, we know from chapter number three um, what happened there with the serpent showing up and um, God having to um, continue on in, in changing the way he dispenses or the way he has chosen throughout history to dispense his grace. And um, you get to um, this whole creation of Adam and Eve. You guys know the story. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel. He had, they have another son by the name of Seth. And uh, Seth is... Um, finds himself in a huge dilemma, just like you and I. Um, he's found to be um, created in Adam's image. And uh, we're reminded of that in Romans chapter number 5, verse 12, as Paul is revealing to you and to me that everybody, every human being that is born physically on this planet is born lost, is born in a, with a human condition that needs redemption. So as you look, and again, it's page number 12 in your little booklet. As you look at that bigger, broader picture, God begins to um, do some amazing things in those first 12 chapters of, of, of Genesis. He brings about Abraham in the 12th chapter. And from chapter 12 to the rest of the chapter, um, God is dealing with uh, what I would refer to as the patriarchs of the Jewish nation. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons. And uh, I think you guys know the rest of the story. At the end of Genesis, they find themselves in Egypt, a type of the world, um, in bondage. And uh, Exodus shows up, and God wants to take, um, under the leadership of Moses and ultimately Joshua, God's people to a promised land, to a land that was promised way back in Genesis chapter number 12. He promised to create a nation, and in the 15th chapter, if you go back and look at it, um, he promised them a boundary, a piece of property, if you will, where they were to establish his kingdom on this earth. And man, for a while, things were going good. Things were uh, pretty hunky-dory through all of the... Uh, uh, throughout all of the Old Testament, not to say that they didn't have their issues. God's people didn't have their issues, kind of like you and I, God's people in the New Testament. Uh, you continue on. We get a little content. We let our guard down. God has to do certain things in our lives, like you find in the book of Judges. 
And um, by the time you get to the middle part of the Old Testament, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, um, God is working in a huge way to establish a kingdom on this earth, especially revealed to us. It's, it's specifically revealed to us in 1st Kings where Solomon is king. Everything that God had hoped for and planned, and not that God needs hope, he is hope, right? But everything that God uh, designed or intended to happen happens in that first, those first 10 chapters of the book of 1 Kings and Israel's at its apex. And uh, we know the rest of the story where um, Solomon, the king of Israel, um, gets his eyes off of God, his priorities change, and voila, man, a downward spiral from there. Sound familiar a little bit, as you'll see here tonight? the natural tendencies that God's people have both in the Old and in the New Testaments. So the whole, the entire New Testament from 1 Kings chapter 11 through the rest of the entire book, um, God is sending prophets and revealing to God's people to get right or things are not going to be so good. And um, that's your Old Testament. So the kingdom is lost in the Old Testament. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves in the New Testament. Jesus shows up in the Gospel of Matthew, and um, he came for one reason and one reason only, and that's to establish his kingdom on earth. And uh, even that got rejected. Are you with me? And as we saw last week, because of that rejection, um, God changes his plan significantly, radically. And he says, this is no longer going to be a Jewish thing, but now I'm going to open the door up to non-Jews as well. What's the biblical term for a non-Jew? Remember that, Abel, from last week? What's a non-Jew referred to in Scripture? A what? A Gentile. Good job, Abel. A Gentile. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. And um, you see this transition play out as we saw last week in the book of Acts. If you remember, we were going through those that little outline, that little chart that we provided you to kind of show you how and where things fit in historically in that book. Um, the, in the early part of the book, the disciples are still expecting and looking for a kingdom. Uh, Jesus is revealing them to them these really cool spiritual things. It's going right over their head. Um, you get to the sixth verse of chapter one, and uh, they are still asking, all right, Lord, cool. Thanks for sharing all this really neat stuff to us, but when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And his response is profound. He says, it's not for you to know the times nor the seasons, but just be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. Unbeknownst to them, like unbeknownst to some of us, when we don't have any clue of God's true and genuine plan, uh, historically or even biblically, um, we just come to church and we play church because that's what we do in Western civilization or in the Western world. But no, God's had a purpose and a plan. Needless to say, every time God moves, what happens next? Satan counters. God will move, Satan will counter. Does that ring a bell? Even our own personal lives, does he not? So in spite of the fact that although the devil still is moving, even in our lives as believers, you're already an overcomer. You're already victorious in God's eyes, um, as we'll see specifically tonight in the book of Ephesians in this amazing letter um, to the letter to the Ephesians. So again, just kind of a broad, really broad perspective because what God ultimately intent does, the kingdom of God is lost in the Old Testament, but the kingdom of God is ultimately restored restored. Are you ready for that? Redeemed in the New Testament. That's always God's plan and purpose. And it begins with what Lucifer did way back in eternity past. He's always been about restoring, redeeming a fallen, broken world, a fallen creation, the universe, a fallen planet, earth. And we just happen to live on this planet called earth. And we inherited a broken, um, sinful nature. And um, Jesus fixed that at the cross. Praise God. So the kingdom of God is restored in the New Testament. Again, that doesn't discount the fact that he's still not dealing with people groups as we've already learned, as we're going to see in our book of Revelation diagram. Um, 
the redemption or the restoration, not just spiritually, but also physically for the believer is going to happen at that event we, that we know as the rapture, right? When is Israel restored? When are they redeemed? At the second coming of Christ. The Jew and the church. Principle number two, the three groups of people. So you see God just continually dealing with those people groups throughout the scriptures. Um, again, just by way of, 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 of background, you guys are familiar with this map. Um, look with me in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 real quick, just by way of review. It says this in, our, in the text, back in chapter number 1, just to kind of give you some, some perspective. This is the historical, right? Look at principle number 4 again. When you open up God's word, you need to put on those three different perspectives, right? Again, I think I've shared this little, this little illustration, this little analogy with you guys. My wife's got reading glasses. Mike, you need to get her some glasses where she could have just like one pair. She's got like five or six pair of reading glasses. I don't know if it has to do with the frames or the, the color or the prescription, if you will. But she, depending on where you're at, she just puts on whatever. Why, why do you do that, Larry? I'm not sure. So you could see, like right now, right? Um, and it's like, it's like that. You need to approach God's word just like you would put on a different pair of glasses. She's got some for distance. She's got some for reading. She's got some for making sure that um, I look better with glasses when they're this thick. So... Um, yeah, so you've got this historical view that you need to maintain. We need to realize that God's word is a history book. It's a history book. And you're going to get a biblical worldview, not a secular worldview when it comes to um, what God has revealed to us in his word. Again, you take that word history, it's two syllables, right? It's his story. The Bible is his story. And whether people like it or not, believe it or not, um, it, uh, it's reveals to us. I, I remember distinctly, um, after, um, after learning the word of God and my, my kids were going through junior high and high school and, uh, they would give them their history textbooks, whether it be world history or some other form of history. Um, I would always look up the, the part in the book where the Jews were mentioned just to see if there was any significance to, uh, God's people being mentioned in a secular, but very little, talked about a, a, uh, an exodus from Egypt and I was probably half of a page of a thing. Because why is that? Because we're going to get a Gentile view. We're going to get a Gentile perspective, Western civilization view of God's word. Well, you know what? God's going to give you an Oriental view because of who he is. God's going to reveal to us the big picture, the broader picture, the purpose behind anything and everything that he does. So this is why we need to learn this book historically. One of the things that I encourage people to do, take your Bibles real quick, stay there on chapter number two because this is a really neat verse to, to be mindful of. Whenever I'm discipling people for the first time, they may be new to the Bible. This is a verse I point them to from a biblical approach, if you will. As a matter of fact, I think there's a, um, there's a, little, a little page. Could I look at that real quick, Roberta? And I'll tell you what page to turn to because this little section um, will help you with that perspective. It's, um, it's on page 10. So this is principle number four, right? Principle number four is the three applications of scripture, different pair of glasses depending on your approach to God's word. Um, and if you look on, at the top of the, um, the page, there's a verse that I often encourage people to apply when they're approaching God's word. Um, Paul says to Timothy, this young man that he discipled, till I come, he says, give attendance to reading. You want to learn the Bible? You want to understand the Bible historically and just get familiar with what God did historically in the life of the nation of Israel? You know what I would recommend you do? Just read it. Just read the Bible if you see a passage or you're going through a passage that you don't f grasp or whatever, just, that's okay. Just read right through it because God wants you to approach that passage in a different way. So if you want to get familiar with the Bible and just kind of see how everything connects, just read God's word to get 
and, and, and make that connection with all that transpired. For example, in, in those last several chapters in, cha- in the book of Genesis when he's dealing with Israel spe- specifically from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 50. Just read it. I'm grateful and Larry will tell you we had a pastor in Kansas City and, and one of the things that he encouraged us to do is just go through the Bible several times a year. You can find some really good reading plans online even that will help you stay on track or on schedule. Don't treat it like a rosary, like something that you have to do each and every day, right? But make sure that you get familiar with God's word from a reading perspective, just to get that historical perspective. And then the second application is the doctrinal, right? And this is also referred to, or I often refer to it as the prophetic. So everything that we're doing with this study on Wednesday nights in the book of Revelation, we're going to give you a doctrinal view. In other words, what is the Bible specifically teaching um, prophetically? What does it reveal to us about what we're going to begin talking about tonight? The church age versus Israel. What does the Bible say about the Gentiles versus the Jews? Those are all doctrinal studies that you need to do. And you know how you do that? I think we've already taught you that if you apply those principles, you apply principle number five, for example. The words and the phrases of the Bible are key to understanding its truths, right? The principle of first mention, the first and, um, um, the first and um, full mention. So all those principles, if you apply it, you apply them when you're studying God's word and Really, the only thing you need when you're studying God's word is a Bible and a what? And a good concordance. And um, I don't know, at some point, maybe we'll show you how to use some of the stuff that's online. Some very, very effective ways to study. My wife will tell you that when I'm reading my Bible, I still read from here, from this. Plus, I love the smell of books and pages, don't you? Uh, But when I study... I'll have my Bible open, but I'll rarely, are you ready for this? This may sound a little bit sacrilegious. I rarely even refer to my hard copy Bible. I'm doing it all here because I'm doing word studies. I'm doing friends. I'm looking at occurrences. How many times does this word show up? How many times does this phrase show up? What context does it show up? So now God's revealing truth to you from just simply looking at words and phrases. Remember, you remember 1 Corinthians chapter number 2? that you get into the depth of God's word, these deep parts of God's word, when you compare what? Scripture with scripture. The Bible always interprets itself. It doesn't need you and me to interpret. How many of you have been to a Bible study in a living room or somewhere? Clyde, you better not be doing this at yours. Where people come together and everybody, they read a passage and everybody, they go around the room. What do you think it says? What do you think? And everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a thought. It really doesn't matter what you think or what I think it says. It matters what God says. The Bible says what it means and means what it says. And you do that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. I had a really good question just on Sunday a couple weeks ago about fasting. Somebody was asking without, and I appreciate what Pastor Mike has brought and introduced to this church from a prayer perspective, because now we got people fasting. But if you're fasting for the sake of fasting, you're just doing diet stuff, man. But it better be totally connected with your prayer life. That's its purpose. That's intent. You can't, you can't see prayer without fasting and fasting without prayer. There's a reason. There's a purpose behind everything that God does. And how and when you do, that's between you and God. Nobody needs to know, but I would encourage you to do it. So that being said, studying God's word. So this is what we're doing on Wednesday nights. We're getting in there and we're looking at the doctrinal and we're also looking at the prophetic applications of scripture. And what's principle number three? This is the hard one, actually. This is the hardest one for everybody to apply. Why is that? Anybody have any thoughts? What do you think? (laughs) Roberta, do you want this back? Page 10 is a useful little tool, by the way. Applying it, right? That's what Paul's saying, right? That's what he said in that verse that we just mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Till I come, he says, give attendance to what? Reading, doctrine, or exhortation, right? What does the word exhort mean? Anybody know? Anybody have a thought? It means to encourage you know, I get encouraged from God's word and I would encourage you to do this. Memorize it. Memorize scripture. 
And let God bring a verse up to your heart and to your mind whenever you're going through a difficult time, right? And memorize the word of God. That's how you can be exhorted. You could be lifted up. And then the doctrinal part, till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. That's the study part. Can anybody in this room, I know some of you do because you have your good, healthy diets. Can you live on salad alone or in roughage? Not me, man. I like meat. That's what doctrine is to me, man. I got to have a burger every once in a while. Me and Larry will t- jump in the car and we'll do a Freddy's run all the way to Española just to get a smash burger, right? So doctrine's your meat. Your roughage is your reading the Bible and your vegetables, the stuff that's good for vitamins, vitamin B, vitamin D is your exhortation, your memorizing scripture, balanced meal. That's just a thought, just something I would encourage you to do. So looking at our text here, this historical application, we're going to put on our historical eyes. I want you to get this historical view of the text. Look at verse 9. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, look where he finds himself. Remember this? In the Isle of Patmos. Patmos to this day is a Greek island off the coast of modern day Turkey. He goes on, he says, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he says this, this is a really key verse. This is a more of a prophetic application verse. But look at verse 10. He says to to you and to me in that 10th verse, I was in the spirit when? On the Lord's day. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Again, looking at words and phrases, if we were to take that phrase Lord's day and run it through the Bible, including the Old Testament, what would it reveal to us? It would reveal to us, the context would be the second coming of Christ. The guy has literally been transported spiritually into the future. 2,000 years. Look at this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice and a trumpet saying, I am the alpha, the omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the what? The seven churches. And then he's going to go on. He's going to reveal. He's going to identify those seven churches. Watch this. And unto the seven churches, which are in, are you ready for this? In Asia. We would know it from a theological perspective. The term Asia Minor is often used, but it's what's modern day Turkey today. We know that Asia has been, the scope of Asia has been broadened from a continental perspective, which includes all of China, the Far East, and all those Asiatic countries, right? But from a biblical New Testament Asia Minor perspective, he's talking about what we know today as modern day Turkey. Look at this. The first and the last, and thou seest in a book, right into the seven churches which are in Asia, and he's going he's gonna to rattle them off. And look at the first one that he mentions. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And again, looking at that map, which is one of your charts, I just want to give you again a little bit of some context. This is where they show up. And if you... Um, Look at your chat. Does it ever have that little map of Turkey up? It's going to be in your big notebook, your broader notebook. It looks like this. There's the island. There's Patmos right over here. This is where John physically is historically. This is all happening about 90 AD. By this time, all the apostles except John have been martyred, have been killed. And these are the seven churches that we just rattled off. This is church number one. This is the one we're going to look at tonight. That's why it's got a red dot. Ephesus, then Smyrna next week. Pergamum or Pergamus, chapter number, uh, uh, the third one I mean, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. And the last one that is mentioned is Laodicea. Here's what's really cool about our study tonight. Ephesus is the only place, the only church that is mentioned both in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 within the context of these last seven churches or these seven churches and also in Paul's writings. So the Lord addresses them through the angel that John writes about in 
chapter number two, verses one through seven that we'll look at tonight, as well as Paul writes a letter that he commits to. That's how unique this Ephesian church was. And it's unique, and God, and God chooses this particular church to start the church age with because of what it represents, because of what it is. He could have started anywhere, right? But he started with Ephesus. And you're going to see that as we start to unpack the various characteristics of each one of these, these seven churches Again, I also want to remind you that prophetically, the structure of the book of Revelation, um, these are also found in verses 10. We just read that verse. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day. Remember this from our study of a few weeks ago? So John finds himself, what, 2,000 years into the future? So let's, by way of example, let's assume that the rapture happened tonight. Wouldn't that be cool? I know I'd be glad. I'd be a happy dude. When would this event play, be playing out? How many years? Seven years later. And we'll see that in our diagram here in a minute. So technically on what year? 20, 2030. 2030. So are we there? Man, I would hope so. I would hope so. So he finds himself blasted 2,000 years in the future. And then he says this, the Lord reveals him. And again, if you look at your, um, your, these two chapters, chapters two and three, does anybody have a red letter Bible that they possess, that they own? Did you notice something unique about these two chapters? Every single word is red. What's the implication? What does that mean? Do we know what that means, Christy? Every single word led. Every single word to these seven churches are Jesus' words directed to an angel that is represented for these seven churches. Look at the verse. Look at verse number 19. He tells him this. These are two key verses. They go kind of hand in glove, verse 10 and verse 19. Look at this. Write these things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Did you catch the significance of that verse? What did Jesus just tell John to do? By the way, anybody have a red letter Bible? Look, look at verse 19, 18, 19, and 20. They're red. What did Jesus tell him to do? To write things down. What's this, how did he tell him to write things down? A little bit of feedback. In the past. Yeah, in three tenses. In the past, in the present, and in the future. So that brings us to the structure of the book. And again, I want to just throw the book of Revelation slide up real quick, Larry. And again, it's in your booklet, in your little book somewhere. And it looks like this. This is a really, really important, extremely important chart to start memorizing and start thinking about. Because not only is John finding himself right around here on the Lord's Day, um, what you also find is the Bible, I'm sorry, the book of Revelation divided perfectly into three parts based on two significant events, the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. Only two places in the entire book where you find the phrase, and I saw heaven opened. Revelation 4.1 and Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11. They're down here. There's 4.1. And there's 19.11. In 4.1, somebody goes up. You notice the significance of the little red arrow? That would be Jesus, Jesus' location. Did you know, church, that he's not coming down to this planet at the revelation? I'm sorry, at the rapture, at the revelation. He's not. You know where you're going to meet him, according to... First Thessalonians chapter four verses. You're going to meet him in the clouds. Yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> tonight, baby, tonight may be the night. You're going to meet him in the clouds. And then the other event, the other time heaven opens, there ain't no clouds. Although it will be a cloudy day, according to the book of Revelation, it will be cloudy. But that's when he returns, literally and physically, to planet Earth, and he will rule for. How many years? A thousand years. What do you, you know what he does out here? 
he finally establishes that kingdom that God had been attempting to do through mankind from the history of, from the beginning of time. From, from Genesis chapter 12 on, his kingdom has physically, literally been restored on planet Earth. But until then, John finds himself here and he's writing in three tenses. Look at, there's verse 10 and 19, right? There's 19, all right? Write these things down. Things that thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which how it shall be hereafter. So he's telling John to write in the past, right? Are you with me? So where would he find himself if he's looking to the past? He's writing about the last 2,000 years if we're at 2023 or 2030. He's looking back. And that's what we're going to be doing in the coming weeks. We're going to be looking back. You're going to see how prophetically these seven churches and they're revealed to you in some detail in your in your little in your in your diagram on this chart it gives you the years in which they existed for example you're going to see that the ephesian period began at the book of acts in 33 AD right at the book of acts and came to an end or fruition right around 200 AD and then Smyrna, which is known as Red One or is the persecuted church from 200 AD to 325 AD, the Smyrna period shows up. And this is known as the persecuted church. And then because of the whole persecution thing, I don't know if you know this about history. Anytime the church is persecuted, anytime throughout history, it explodes do you have any idea what's going on right now in places like Iran and China? Did you know that the, the church is booming? People are coming to Christ. I Persian, Muslim, Iranians are coming to Christ to Christ in huge numbers. I have a little video that I show periodically of these Chinese believers that were having to meet in the underground church, in the basement of their church and these Westerners were able to deliver some Bibles in, China, in Chinese. They, hadn't, they didn't even have their own Bibles. And they, when they got a copy of their Bible, they started to weep and they started to cry. And there's several of them that are just kissing their Bible. They were so privileged and so blessed to have a Bible. Could you imagine if we took two or three cases from that storage room up there to the plaza and put them out for people to take? How many, how many Americans do you think would help themselves to a Bible? They'd probably rip it, huh? They'd probably throw it in the trash. They'd spit on it. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes, sir. You get one question and that's it for the evening. Yes, you do. Yeah. Adults, yeah. Church, yeah. And everything is being pushed on them as for equality. And mm. my wife and I sat a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, and we said, guess what? If the church goes in the rapture, our house. What do you mean, if? When the church. Oh, okay, when? That's better. <laughs> better go, man. If, if the church would go tonight. Yeah. Of course. My house will have the keys to my car. My daughter's house is going to be empty. And they've got two cars, three cars. And my son's house is going to be... This church, for the most part, is going to be empty without a minister. And it's the great equality that the earth, Gentiles, non-Christian, non-church, non-Jews, are looking for. They want equality. They're going to get it. It's going to be a great reset all across the world. And everybody's going to be equal because all the treasures are going to be passed out to who has ever left. So it is going to be a pretty good time for three and a half years. <laughs> Why don't you come up here and teach the class? Because <laughs> you, just, you just did a great, you just did a great overview synopsis of the, everything on that chart because you're right. So, yeah, 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 and that's what this study is about. We want to make sure that we grasp 
the gravity of what's going to play out. Because I'm, I say this every time we have this Bible study on whether it was our study in Matthew 24 of last fall or what we're doing in Revelation, there are loved ones that we know and we love and we care for that will be left behind, right? That's significant. That's huge to me. So if there's ever a reason and a motivation to embrace what that sign says, that mission feel, that personal one-on-one evangelism that needs to happen let's just start let's just start seeing people come to christ um because it's going to happen it's imminent um how and when that's up to him but until then just know that as we look at this part of our our because this is where we're hanging out in the next several weeks we're going to be looking at smyrna next week 200 325 a.d Uh, The church is being persecuted, as I mentioned earlier, in a huge, huge way, in a massive way. It's exploding throughout Greece and even Europe. And um, you guys are familiar with the whole experience that the Emperor Constantine had, Um, right? The vision of the cross that caused his conversion. It was a lie. It was a lie. And at that point, he embraces Christianity. This Roman emperor goes from being a pagan Roman emperor to now technically the first pope. And that is known as the Pergamus period or the the church of Pergamum. You know what the word Pergamus means? Much marriage. The church marries the world. And that's where you see this mixture, if you will, between paganism and Christianity, which we know today as the Roman church. In the meantime, there's these Bible believers that were being persecuted. The Waldensians, the Albadenians, the Lawlers, the Pollicans that are flying below the radar still staying true to God's word as paganism is being introduced. And then the next or the fourth church is the church of Thyatira. Look at when it shows up. 500 to 1000 AD. What's the significance of 1000 AD? That was the peak of what? The Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. Darkest period in all of church history. And uh, the Black Plague is prevalent. This Europe is in chaos. They're starting to move into the Crusades so they could retake the Holy Land. And uh, just amazing time that we're going to be unpacking and studying. And then right after Thyatira, Thyatira is the church age known as Sardis. Sardis is technically when the Reformation begins, if you look at those dates, 1000 to 1500 AD, and uh, that launches what we know today as the Philadelphian Church Age, Um, and man, what a period that was. That's when this country's founded, God's word is going out. When you get to the Philadelphian Church Age, remember we talked about this on Sunday, what does the word Philadelphia mean? Brotherly Brotherly love, man, it's happening. 30... Three quarters, 75% of the planet knows Jesus Christ as Savior during the Philadelphian church age. And um, we'll get into this. And then Rome obviously wants to stop what's happening. And they begin to do some things, some major tampering with God's plan. And here's where and how we end up with what we know today as the Laodicean church. Begins when? 1900. Now, as we start looking at the verses in each one of these church periods, you're going to be amazed at the historical events and occurrences that have played out and how the Spirit of God reveals them to us in the text. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible. So look at the last church period mentioned. Starts in 1900 AD, Laodicea, and what does it end with? The rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. So what does that imply? Somebody give me a thought that you are living in which church period? Which, which, which part of the, Yeah. I say that all to you guys all the time, you bunch of Laodiceans. Remember what the word Laodicea means? No. The rights of the people. Are you with me? Is that not prevalent or what? Where people's rights are more important, more significant than, than God's rights. What you feel matters, right? That's where we're at. Are you See the characteristics? Wait till we unpack those last several verses beginning in verse number 14 
through 22. It's, it's, it's crazy. We'll probably camp out with that Laodicean, that Laodicean age for about three weeks with the amount of depth and incredibleness. Who can give me the, um, the New Testament letter that kind of connects the dots with Laodicea with us? Colossians. Colossians. Good job, Arlene. The letter to the Colossians, right? Remember that from our study last, when was it? Last summer, whenever it was. I think we titled that series, the letter on Sunday mornings, the letter to the last day's church. Why is that? This place, Laodicea, is mentioned four times in the letter to the Colossians. Why? They were sister cities, Albuquerque, Rio Rancho, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas. Two very distinct cities. Culturally, they were very different, but um, Paul tells Paul tells the Colossians, when you read this letter to the church in Colossae, make sure it's also read to the church in Laodicea. That's how significant it is. And um, if you want a good grasp of the issues that we're contending with and dealing with in this church period, the Laodicean period, I would encourage you to go study the letter to the Colossians. Four times in the second chapter of Colossians, Paul warns the believers in Colossae about deception, diff- different forms, about tradition, about religion, all those things that Christians are caught, caught up in today. So just again, by way of review, let me show you this next. So look, are everybody with me? We're going to be looking. We're going to be camping out. And as Jim very did a good job teaching us and revealing to us a few minutes ago, once the rapture happens, there's going to be a seven, Steve just mentioned, there's going to be a seven-year period known as the tribulation period. Now, the tribulation period, and you'll see this when we get to the text in Revelation chapters 9, 13, and somewhere else, is divided into two parts, into two halves. The tribulation period, the first three and a half years, and the great tribulation is the term that Jesus used the second half. Now, in the first half, um, God's kingdom will be counterfeited. This is where the Antichrist will be worshipped as the Messiah, as uh, he'll be Christ to whoever believe in, believes in Christ. Uh, in, um, in the tribulation period, to the Muslims, he'll be the 12th Imam, and to the Jews, he'll be the Messiah. And I don't know if you guys are keeping track with some of the news recently, but man, Israel is pushing hard and heavy on getting that third temple uh, built. Yeah. And that needs to happen for a lot of these events to ultimately play out. We'll be showing you some interesting videos, especially when we get to the 11th chapter of the book of, uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, so man, just exciting times that we find ourselves in. So this is the heart of our study. So except for chapters 4 and 5, see this little red box in your chart? These are going to be some heavenly events. So right after the rapture, God is going to be doing some things um, in and through us, the believer. You're going to see three significant events. You're going to see the judgment seat of Christ. We'll talk about that event when we get there. This is also lesson number 16 in discipleship. Um, We'll also talk about the seven seals books because one of the things that God does um, is he gathers us on the banisters of heaven, and he opens up these, the, the seven seals. And he says, all right, man, look down, because I'm about to unleash hell on planet Earth. And then the third and final event is known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So those are all heavenly events that are revealed to us in chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. And then you get to chapter 6, and this is where you find the seven seals. And the first four of the seven seals are what we know as the four horsemen of the what? Of the apocalypse. And we'll talk about the four horsemen and what they represent. Um, and then we'll get into the seven trumpets, the seven seals. When we get to chapters 6 and chapters 19, um, there's an interesting thing that I want you to understand about the structure of that part of the Bible or that part of the book of Revelation as we get into it. So, okay, so here's where we're at. Um, again, in time, we'll get into that. The second coming will happen, and Jesus will rule on planet Earth for a thousand years. We're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Check this out. Ezekiel, um, Zechariah, all kinds of passages in the, right here in the book of, uh, in the Old Testament that reveal to us how God's going to govern, 
how he's going to institute his own constitution to his kingdom as he rules and reigns on planet earth for a thousand years. Uh, do you not find it interesting that all these, um, uh, especially these European Gentile nations in, in, um, in just the last century have been attempting to counterfeit that kingdom, right? When you think of the, when you try, when you think of Hitler doing what he wanted to do when he was referring to the Third Reich, guys, guys familiar with that phrase, the term that was given to his kingdom and what he was, and what he was hoping to shoot for and plan for. In fact, he had a, an architect by the name of, um, what was his name? Uh, Albert Speer. Albert Speer, who had designed these amazing buildings and structures that were going to be taking, that were going to be in, the, in Berlin and all over um, what is Germany today. And Hitler's plan from the onset was to establish a kingdom on earth for a thousand years, a German kingdom. So throughout history, man has been trying to counterfeit what God does. This guy ultimately does it. This guy that we know as the Antichrist. We're going to spend some time looking at what the Bible says about who he is. There's an entire section in your booklet that reveals to us um, a lot of his character or his, his characteristics, if you will. And we'll be looking and unpacking those, those passages and those, um, those different types that you find in the Bible that reveal so much to us about who he is and how he's going to function. I know that there's a lot of people out there that, um, that feel that they already know that he's been revealed. And is it this knucklehead king from England? I forget his name, Charles II, or is it... Uh, is it Macron from France? Is it, uh, is it Zelensky from Ukraine? <laughs> All these ideas and notions. The Bible's pretty clear in Second Thessalonians chapter number 2 that the revealing of who he is won't happen till right after the rapture. However, we will see a lot of the events and a lot of the signs that are going to play up to that point. So um, can't wait to get to chapter 2 of uh, the letter to the second Thessalonians. All right, so this is what our outline looks like real quick. Uh, we're gonna look at the characteristics of Ephesus, uh, the commendation that God, oh, thank you for throwing this up, Larry. This is a handy little chart. I don't think we have this in your notebooks, do we not? Okay, we will get you a copy of this, but this is the seven churches, and the reason why I showed them in this manner is because of this verse right here. You know, Paul says something really significant, really profound in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. We'll be unpacking this in a few months when we get to this chapter. But Paul reveals to the church in Thessalonica that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So in that seventh verse of the second chapter, which Paul, if you look at the context, he's talking about the Antichrist and the fact that he's going to be t worshipped in the temple by the Jews, by the world, um, he says, no, that this event will culminate, but until that event happens, the devil is already working and affecting and impacting what God is doing in the church age. Are you with me? I think we all know that, huh? Uh, to me, the Pergamus period is a huge one. When, Const when Constantine realized that he couldn't, he couldn't overcome, he couldn't defeat these, these believers that were being persecuted, he says, you know what, if you can't beat them, let's join them. And sure enough, he did. So the devil is working. Every time God moves, Satan counters. God will move. Satan will counter. There's seven mysteries. As a matter of fact, it's in the back of your booklet that are revealed to you. And this is one of those seven mysteries. And Paul drives home the importance and the significance that the church age is going to begin, but the attacks are going to come right away and they're going to be intense. And that's what we'll be looking at. So again, we're going to look at the uh, apostolic church, what we're going to be talking about tonight. And again, if you, I would encourage you to go back and, and, and look at last month's uh, gift study that Pastor Mike did because he talked about um, the apostles and their role in God's plan, the apostolic gifts, which are trying to be robbed and, and, and applied out of context in the church age oftentimes. And it's happening today like never before. Um, and again, look at what the word Ephesus means. Isn't that cool? Fully purposed. That God would begin 
the church age with the Ephesian church because of what it represents and what it means. God's got a purpose for the church. It's unique. If you look at all those other people groups and everything that God has done historically, there's been no period like the church, like the church age. And then the next one is Smyrna. That means bitterness and death. We'll, we'll, we'll know when we get there. That's known as the persecuted church from 200 to 325 AD. Much marriage, the Pergamus period, also known as um, the compromising church. Uh, where Rome basically takes over what we know today as the Western church. And then the fourth church, Thyatira. The odor of affliction is, the, is what that name literally means. It's the dead church. This is the peak of the dark ages. The fifth church being Sardis, the afflicted church or red ones. There's another level of persecution that begins to happen during that period. And then if you notice, Philadelphia is kind of lifted up kind of high, huh? That's a unique period. It's a very unique period in church history. Uh, this is the church, the only church where God doesn't have a condemnation referred to it because of what it was doing and what it was involved with. This is known as the what? The evangelistic church, the missionary church, sending missionaries all over the planet, seeing Christ. But you know what God did? Anybody have any clue what the devil did to counter this amazing period from, from 1500 to 1900 A.D.? What did he do? That's right. Let me show you an interesting verse. We're, we're going to unpack this. Look at, look at Revelation chapter number three. Real quick. Oh, we're gonna show, I'm going to tell you right now. Look at this. Look at Revelation chapter three. Verse seven. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, say at the amen, that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Very, very unique church period. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man can open. In other words, it's an open door to the gospel. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied it. Look at verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the what? The synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is where you find replacement theology with what I would refer to as all the American cults that begin to pop up in this church period. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, all these what I refer to as wannabe Jews. Replacement theology. And guess where they were all birthed? Yeah, freedom of religion. You mark any cult today, and it was birthed in America. Of course, yeah. The, the two rods, right? The two rods, apostolic succession, there another. Mike did a great job revealing that whole apostolic succession lie that, had, that started when? Way back with the Ephesian church. Well, actually, the Council of Nicaea. When was the council? You know who? Guess who, um, who organized or, or, or what's the term? Um, convened that first, that first Catholic council in Nicaea? Constantine. And you know what his main agenda was? apostolic succession the mormons have ripped that off the jews have i'm sorry the jews the jehovah's witnesses all these places all these groups began to show up when in the early to mid 1800s and in the meantime there's this really sinister group working behind the scenes really causing a lot of chaos and corruption during this period i think you guys know who they are all right, so let's look at our outline real quick. It's only 8 o'clock, 8.04. <laughs> so we're going to just look at seven verses. This should go pretty quick. We're going to look at the characteristics at Ephesus in verse 1, some things that I want you to consider. This commendation that he has for these Ephesian believers. And then there's a condemnation 
that you find. And I'm going to try to stick to this little outline, this little cool pattern throughout the seven churches. And all these will, they'll, they'll have more, some churches, some ch- church periods will have uh, more significant characteristics than others or more condemnation than others. But uh, pretty much this will be our outline for the next several weeks as we unpack these seven churches. And then we'll look at the, lo- the conclusion here in verses five through seven. All right? So look with me at verse one. The characteristics of the Ephesian believers. It says this, and unto the angel, are you, again, are you getting these? These are Jesus' words, mind you. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, remember the seven stars that we looked at in Revelation chapter one, verse 20? Those seven stars are the seven angels. So here's something to be mindful of and we need to be aware of that angels have been assigned to some of these churches or to these churches. And anybody know the role or the purpose of angels in the Bible? They're messengers. So God is going to communicate these truths, these characteristics, these commendations, these uh, these um, uh, condemnations to these angels. And then it's their responsibility to communicate them to the people through history and through the events that will ultimately play out. Angels are a major part of God's plan, his purpose. I don't have to tell you that. You guys have been here a while and you understand the fact that God has this amazing hierarchy of uh, angelic beings, beginning with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Below them are the cherubim, these really powerful angels. Lucifer happened to be a cherubim. Uh, And below the cherubim is another group of angels known as the seraphim. You find those guys around the letter um, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number six, for example. These were these winged beings kind of surrounding the throne. They'll show up again in in, um, in, um, Revelation chapter number four. And then below the seraphim are the archangels. Uh, Very powerful angels. The Bible mentions two by name in the Bible. Anybody know who they are? Michael and and Gabriel. Two very distinct, very unique functions that they play out. Anytime Gabriel shows up, like in the book of Daniel, as well as in the gospel of Luke, um, Gabriel's role is to what? To prepare the world for the Messiah. His job is to prepare the planet. He does it in the Old Testament. He also does it prophetically in the Old Testament. Then he shows up in the gospel of Luke. Michael, on the other hand, has a very, very unique role in the Bible. His, he is the guardian angel of, not to say Michael's horsemen, for all you horsemen in the room. He's the guardian angel for Israel. He's the protector of the nation of Israel. You see him showing up in the book of Jude, in the book of Daniel. He's all over the place, man. He's a mighty, powerful angel. Are there more archangels? I believe there are. And we know that from, again, the book of Daniel chapter 2 where these powerful angels are assigned to entire nations. And in this case, we find some angels, some angelic beings assigned to the seven churches. And each church, the Bible or Jesus will speak directly to that angel who now has a responsibility to communicate that message that we're going to be looking at for each one of these churches in, um, in the text. He says in verse 1, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Who's the he holding the seven stars? It's Jesus, right? Revelation one twenty. Again, the, di- the Bible will interpret itself. And Bethany, and who are the seven stars represented? They represent who? And what? No. The seven stars are what? are the seven angels. The seven something represent the seven churches. The seven what? The seven candlesticks. And if you remember from verse 20, Jesus finds himself in the midst of the candlesticks, right? Because in spite of the devil working and doing what he's doing, as Paul revealed to us, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, God is always in the midst of the church making sure that those that are staying true to his word Um, are taken care of will they experience persecution absolutely but nonetheless um, he's there look at this 
he, he that, that has the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the what? The seven golden candlesticks. Revelation 2.1. Couple thoughts about this term or this word Ephesus or Ephesian. As you've already seen in a couple previous slides, it means fully purposed. That's what the word Ephesus means. And it was really awesome because when we gathered for the first time as a church in this building, um, it was awesome how the Lord led us to do a study in Ephesians. And um, can anybody remind me of what our theme was? Several years ago, I think it was in 2000. We moved in in June of two. Can you imagine? It's already going to be eight years that we've been in the building. Man, that went by quick. Yes. She's reading my notes. How dare you, Larry? Remember, our theme was higher ground. Higher ground. And why did we embrace the theme higher ground as it relates to this notion or this concept of a fully purposed church? There's an interesting structure to the book of Ephesians, to the letter to the Ephesians. How many chapters are there? Six. And if you look at those six chapters, they divide perfectly in half. The first three chapters focus on your position in Christ. In other words, when God views you as a believer, he views you as one who is seated in a heavenly place, past tense. In other words, you're good to go. That's your identity. That's what you can't lose sight of. Over and over, Paul drives home. In fact, I think I've got a couple of verses here. Look at this. By the way, the word, set, the word purpose or purpose shows up seven times in the letter to the Ephesians. One of the times that it shows up is here in verse, verse 111. In whom also we have ordained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God had a purpose for you even before you knew it. A purpose to be conformed to his image. Look at verse number, chapter number three, verses 10 and 11. To the intent that now into the, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if over and over in those first three chapters, you'll find, you'll find thoughts and phrases, or not thoughts, but, but phrases and these truths that reveal to us that you're seated positionally in a heavenly place. Now the issue and the challenge for you and me is not chapter number three. We lose perspective of that. Your challenge and my challenge is not so much our position, but our what? Our condition. That's what chapters... Four, five, and six are about. They Paul begins to talk to us about our walk. And your condition will only be able to match your position spiritually. That's what transformation is all about. As you continue to grow in God's grace. And one of the things that we forget as Christians is who we are in Christ. We lose our identity just like that. We start losing hope and we start to question and we start to doubt. You know who and what's affecting us? The world. It's influencing what goes on in your mind and in your head. And Paul drives home all those truths in those last three chapters. Do you not find it interesting that it's in chapters five and six that he deals with relationships? Any and every relationship that you'll encounter in this life? Husband, wife, parent, child, child, parent. Even the workplace stuff are revealed to you in Ephesians chapters 5 and 6. Why is that? Because this is where the battle occurs, is in our relationships. Right? Does anybody know what follows the relationship passage in Ephesians 6.10? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And then he tells you to do th twice. He tells you to do what? To put on the whole armor of God. Are you with me? Are you seeing what this is about? When we fail to put God's armor on, we'll feel defeated and that's going to affect your walk. 
your perspective. It doesn't mean that you're lost. You may feel lost, but it's not about your feelings, right? It's about who and what Christ did for you. The issue is getting back into God's word so that he could keep you on track. Because you're going to see a word here that shows up in the text that is so significant and is profound as we were communicating to our church the importance of this fully purposed church and what it meant to match your condition with your position. In other words, let's get to the high ground. Do you remember the little metaphor that we were using? Those of you that have been up baldy with me all these years. In fact, we started going up baldy when we started our study in Ephesians. There's this one section when you get up to the, I call it the meadow. If you go straight, it'll take you to Pecos. And if you hang a left, it'll take you to Lake Catherine or up baldy. And as you look up to what is known as the Skyline Skyline Trail, if you look at it on the map, you know what you'll see? A series of what? Switchbacks. Switchbacks. In fact, Marvin got me a water bottle, I think a couple years ago that said, enjoy or embrace the switchbacks. (laughs) You know what those switchbacks are? Those points in your journey and in your life where God gives you revelation. Could happen in your reading time, your meditation time, your your time alone with the word. It could have been on a Sunday morning as God's word is being preached. Maybe a night like tonight at a Bible study where God gives you light and you're at a turning point. You're either going to keep climbing, that's a switchback point, or you're going to quit and go back down. Or in some cases, you're tired and you're exhausted, you want to quit and you just sit down. You know what's another term that we use for those switchbacks? Anybody know? It's an R word. Revelation, it's repentance. You know what he's doing? He's changing the way you think. That's all repent means is changing your thoughts. That's the coal, that's the key to life is letting God changing the way we think about who we are in Christ. It's amazing the number of defeated Christians that I meet each and every day. Each and every day, broken, overwhelmed. You know what happened? We've lost sight of our position. We've lost sight of who we are and we began to focus on what? The climb sometimes, the circumstances, the situations in life that will affect you, that you'll get tired. But what do we do? Just keep climbing because there's gonna be another switchback. There's gonna be another level of revelation that God gives you and man, those are just refreshing times and then you find yourself on the high ground. Now he's changed your perspective, my perspective towards life. That's what he desires to do. That's what he wants to do. And that's what this church represents. This is why God chose these Ephesian believers to do what he did. Look at Ephesians 1.3. Speaking of our position. I love this verse. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath what? Who hath blessed us. Did you catch that? Who hath past tense blessed us with all spiritual blessings where in heavenly places in Christ how cool is that these are the truths that we forget each and every day when we focus on circumstances I'm telling you man this world ain't gonna save you this government ain't gonna save you especially this government right I'm telling you he's your only hope He's your only, he's your only hope. He's my only hope in this crazy, bizarre clown world that we find ourselves in. You're seated in a heavenly place, Paul says. Look at verse number six of chapter number two. This is another really awesome verse. Are you with me? Where's this showing up? In the first three chapters. Chapters one, two, and three. Look at chapter two. And he hath raised us up. And he hath raised us up, past tense, hath, together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many of you believe that? Did you know that right now, spiritually, you're seated in a heavenly place? You know what's keeping you on this planet? The stinking body. (laughs) That's why this bodily, spiritually, you've been resurrected, 1 Corinthians 15 right? Have we bodily been resurrected? 
What does Paul address in the last part of that chapter? A bodily resurrection. The mystery of the rapture of the church in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 through 58. That's what we're going to talk about in a few, couple weeks on a Sunday morning, man. Don't ask me how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. He's going to give you, he's going to give me a glorified body. I'm at a point in my life where I get out of bed, man, and I will twist my knee just getting out of bed. <laughs> However, though, Abel in Jamaica can't st- still can't keep up with me on the mountain. Right? I was hanging some, what's that stuff called behind behind sheetrock? The stuff with fiberglass in it? Insulation. I was hanging insulation. And I stepped off this little stepladder. And I think I tore a ligament in my knee. This body needs to be replaced, man. (laughs) It really does. Yeah. Roberta, you're the only person I know I can't keep up going up Baldy. Man, this God's good. God's good. He's awesome. Some interesting facts, historical facts about this place called Ephesus. Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians in right around 61, 62 AD from Rome. It's one of the four prison epistles that we're all familiar with. Philippians, Colossians, Philemon are the other three. He writes Ephesians from a prison cell. Even from a prison cell, the guy is still revealing to us a perspective that we need to maintain. What an example he is. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was very key. It was a strategic place, not just economically, but also from a uh, political standpoint. It was a very religious place. Remember our time together in Acts chapter 19 a few months ago when we were looking at this uproar that Paul caused when people started coming to Christ and there was this deity that they were all worshiping at Ephesus, Diana of the Ephesians, the um, goddess of fertility is who she was, Artemis to the Greeks. Um, There was this guy named uh, Demetrius the silversmith and he's making on little silver shrines to Diana, and he's making a ton of money. In fact, he was all upset because they were having a, a Spanish market, and Paul started uh, preaching, and he started teaching about Jesus, and people started coming to Christ. You know what that? It affected his livelihood. It affected his wealth. He says, don't you guys know this? He calls this union of silversmiths together. He goes, we need to stop this Paul dude, man, because because of what he's doing, it's affecting our little money supply. So it's a very religious place. And we'll talk more about the the things that the devil has been doing as he's moved throughout Asia Minor and ultimately into Greece and Rome with this whole concept of female goddess worship or what God warned them about in the book of Zechariah, the book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel about the queen of heaven. Um, Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Did I ever share with you that um, the rosary's in the Bible? Did you guys know the rosary's in the Bible? In the, within the context of this goddess. Look at all you looking at me. You're a creep. You're a weirdo. You're lying. <laughs> look at it. Look at Acts 19. Seriously. Look at the book of Acts, chapter number 19. I was just talking about this dude, huh? This is what Paul was up against. It's the same thing that we're up against. If you want to if you want to compare Santa Fe to any biblical city in the Bible, you could compare it to Ephesians to the to Ephesus. A lot of wealth, a lot of prosperity, but they were also into this goddess deity worship. Look with me here in the 19th chapter. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 23, I think. Look at this. And he, the same time there arose no small stir about that way for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, Diana of the Ephesians, 
brought no small gain unto the craftsmen whom he called together with the workmen of like occupying said sirs you know that by this craft we have our wealth somebody highlight the word wealth and i'll unpack an interesting truth about it next week maybe just highlight this word and, and then remind me next week because it's significant in terms of what it reveals to us look at verse 26 moreover you see and you hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul, this preacher boy, hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no more gods which are made with hands. <laughs> that little statue that you're selling, man, ain't just a statue, right? So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world and the world worshipeth. Are you getting the context? See how religion just morphs from one culture to another. Verse 28, and when they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath. And they cried out, saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Caius... And Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one of, with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, and the disciples suffered him not uncertain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent on him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. In other words, Paul, hang loose, hang tight, because they're going to kill you. Um, look at verse 33. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew not that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two hours they heard the phrase, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. <laughs> Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Isn't that interesting? See, religion's religion. I don't care where it starts, where it morphs. The goal of religion is to always get your eyes off Jesus, period, and start worshiping something or somebody else. And in this case, with this Demetrius dude, wealth. Don't mess with my... Don't mess with my livelihood. A lot of people making a lot of money at Indian market and Spanish market and all these other markets. And what do we call it? Religious what? What do we call it? No. Religious art, right? See, I love what Solomon said in, you know, I love what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's no what? There's really no new thing under the sun. People are still people. The devil's still the devil. His goal, his agenda is still to distract, to get you and me to get our eyes off Jesus, period. So religiously, man, it was a key center. And also biblically, I don't know if you know this about the church at Ephesus, but it was also the church that Timothy and John both had the privilege of pastoring at. Isn't that cool? That Paul's number one guy, Timothy, was the first pastor at Ephesus. Let's look at some of the commendations that the Spirit of God gives, um, gives this church. These are Jesus' words again. He says, I know thy what? Thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how, and how thou canst bear them which are evil. Isn't that cool? Although they found themselves in a very religious, very, uh, very pagan culture, they turn their back on the evil. But it also says of these guys that Jesus knew their works, their labor, and their patience. If you remember from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10, again, Paul writing to the Ephesians, he says something really profound to them. He says, all right, all right, Ephesian believers, for by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So 
Paul says to them, man, you don't need to worry about works to come to Christ. You don't need to worry about how many times you, you repeat the words, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Just know that God gave you and me a gift of grace. And that gift of grace is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. For we are his what? We are his workmanship, Paul says in the 10th verse. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. They were doing cool, cool stuff, man. Not works for salvation, but they were doing good works. Why? Because of salvation. Because of who Christ was. And I don't have to tell you there's only two religions on the planet, right? Two and only two. There's that of grace. Those of us that have chosen to believe in God and follow God, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be what? Thou shalt be saved. And because of salvation, we do what we do. By the way, I don't know if you guys know this or not. Um, because of your guys' goodness and your love, your brotherly love for one another, we were able to find Bridget and, uh, and Joel and Arnim of Ann. And it's loaded wow. with a ramp that moves electronically with, oh, are you ready for this? They threw in a full-blown wheelchair that is automated. Did I say that right? Wow. Praise God, huh? God is good, man. And we were concerned, we were patient, and uh, way below budget. And uh, God's good, so... I probably blew it because we were going to surprise her with it <laughs> this Sunday. It's okay. Surprise, Bridget, if you're watching. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> but it's so cool, man. He won't even have to get out of his chair. He'll just be able to roll right up that thing. Open up. You hit a button. The door opens. The ramp comes out. Drives that thing right up. $15,500. For the whole thing. God's good. He's so good, man. So these guys, they were a successful church because of their love for the work of God. It's a verse that we throw out to you guys all the time, right? Speaking of labor, Ephesians 4.12 Mike, Pastor Mike's favorite verse. There's pastors, leaders, teachers in the word in the church. Why? For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, right? Remember this verse? Why? What's our role? What's the purpose of the leadership in this church? To mature you. That's all that word perfect means, right? For the perfecting of the who? Of the saints. And what's the outcome when we perfect the saints? The work of the ministry. It's labor, it's work. This ain't easy. Right? Discipling isn't, isn't an easy thing to do. But that's what we've been called to do, man. And there's nothing sweeter. There's nothing more fulfilling. Nothing more encouraging when you start to see a transformed life. When you start to see God working. Blessing and using. And again, we're still blown away to this day on how the response was from our January casting the vision thing and how so many of you stepped up to 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 teach the children to guide and he's put some really really special people in this body um that get it and so just so so grateful right so it's a successful church it's a i was trying to be kind of witty with this thing i, I used the term a sweating church a church that understood the labor of god <laughs> For the perfecting of the saints, there's that verse, for the work of the ministry, because it is work. And what does that do when those first two things? It edifies the entire body. We're all lifted up. We're all built up. And uh, what an encouraging thing that is. And man, just, I don't know, man. I was, after Larry and I went out to go pick up the van and we met these two sweet, sweet ladies. In fact, they had just bought the van in December for her dad who had dialysis. Um, or for this husband, I mean, for this lady's husband and the, the, the father of this young lady. And he died in April. He passed away in April, just a month ago. And um, um, 
when we told them who and what we were doing it for, and they were like just blown, absolutely blown away. She says, we've never heard anybody do this for somebody, and we're edified. And um, before we even got to the bank so we could get them their money, and I was just in tears, you know, because of his goodness. Because we weren't sure we even... Larry was on the phone talking to places out in North Carolina about these van systems that they do. We were looking and talking to the city and to the county to find the right solution. And man, this was just thrown in our lap. And you know how it happened, which is really cool. I'm behind this pulpit on Sunday. And if you remember, I presented the need. And don't ask me what Michelle Marmon is doing, but I do know this. She was on Facebook during church. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know what's so cool? Michelle sends the link to Larry, to my wife, during church. Check this out. I'm sitting over here. Larry comes to me. She says, check this out. And then I said, go show it to Larry Sosha before the announcements. And Larry's going to Larry Sosha, check this out. And then on Sunday, I mean, on Tuesday, right, Mike, at the meeting, we saw all the details and all the specs, and we're saying, wow. And she, by the way, we're throwing in the chair, and we're also throwing in a Hoyer lift. And we know what a Hoyer lift is? Those lifts that you put around a bed to, like, lift them up to move a person. They gave us that, too. They said, do you guys want anything else? We have some tables that move up and down. I said, well, we should ask them first. And then Sylvia goes and runs to the bank, her and David Duran, and to get the check, and we make a beeline to Espanola. We don't have to go to Espanola. We didn't have to go to North Carolina. And here we are. Wow. He's good, huh? Very. He's so good. Yeah. So good, man. And we had just sang that song earlier. He's so, so good. And it edifies the body, man, when you see his goodness. It was also a patient church. Look at verse um, that verse, I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. Anybody have any clue or any idea how one acquires patience in this life? Through trials. Through trials. Can you give me a book, chapter, verse? No, that's okay. Romans 5, huh? Romans 5, 3 and 4. Paul writes, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations... We grow in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience <laughs> and patience experience and experience hope. I've always heard people say you should never pray for patience. You should pray for patience. Yeah. You know why? Because that's how you're going to grow. Because when you're praying for patience, you're actually saying, Lord, can you bring a trial into my life? You really are. That's your prayer. Right? Lord, give me patience with these drivers in Santa Fe or my boss at work <laughs> or in Vivian's case, my husband at home. <laughs> oh, Lord, please give me patience. <laughs> please give me patience. You know what you're praying? You're saying, Lord, bring me a trial. Bring me a trial because that trial will lead to patience and patience experience and experience hope. Hopefully, we're learning from our experience, right? So don't be fear. Don't be afraid to pray for patience, man. Because that's how God works. That's how he transforms us. Another cool thing about these guys, they despised evil, the Bible says. Or look at the last part of the verse. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And again, you just go back and look at the various places where Paul is dealing with them in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, we just read the passage with this whole religious Diana of the Ephesians thing. He also deals with a um, bunch of wolves in sheep's clothing in Acts chapter 20. <laughs> Paul tells the Ephesian elders, protect your flock because they're out there. And in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 and 16, he says this, he says, walk circumspectly. Why? He says, walk circumspectly. In other words, keep your head on a swill. Be mindful of your surroundings. Know what's going on in the world, what's going on in your life, what's going on in the planet. Walk circumspectly. Why? Because the days are evil. 
He says, redeem the time, make up for lost time because the days are what? Are evil. Are you with me? Paul's writing this at the beginning of the church age, knowing that it was going to get worse all the way, especially worse by the time you get to Laodicea. And that's where we find ourselves. There's a condemnation that is given to these folks here in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4. This was the one downfall of this fully purposed church. And just like you and me, we're all susceptible to any of these challenges and issues. Remember, we have the historical application, right? Those are the seven churches on that map. What's the doctrinal application? The church periods that we find in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 in our, tribula- in our Revelation outline. And then there's the devotional application or the inspirational application. What does that reveal to us? That every, so everybody in this room is probably like one of those seven churches. And a lot of us are susceptible to being like the Ephesians. And what was their issue? What was the condemnation that Jesus gives these folks here in the fourth verse? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I've seen it happen in a lot of people's lives that I never imagined they would walk away from Jesus. We're all susceptible. If it could happen to David, I guarantee it could happen to you. If it can happen to Solomon, it could happen to me. So I never ever take for granted that this can happen because this church was spot on, man. They understood their purpose. They understood their mission. They were fully purpose. God's commending them for their work, their labor, their patience, the fact that they would withstood evil. But yet they what? At some point in those 200 years, from 33 AD to 200 AD, they lost perspective and they lost their first love. Or you have left thy first love. There's some interesting passages in the New Testament that reveal to us some of those things that we all have a tendency of falling in love with. Anybody familiar with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10? Come on, American. I, I know you can relate to this. For the love of what? For the love of money is the what? Is the root of all evil. Not just some evil, all evil. If you want to know why our governmental system at every level has become so corrupt, just look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Because it is the root of all evil. And people and systems and institutions will do anything and everything for a profit, in ter- in, in, including do what they're doing to our children today in the name of a profit. I don't care if it's the military industrial complex to the pharmaceutical complex to everything that's going on in this world today, man. There's certain people at certain levels that are just so, so wicked and evil because of their love for money. There's another thing that Jesus warns or John warns about in 1 John chapter 2. And this is a phrase that we're all familiar with, a verse that we often read in our church. Love not the what? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have a tendency of loving the world sometimes more than loving Jesus. And the things of this world, the things that keep us from intimacy, from a relationship with Him, from being able to experience the simple life. And man, what a condemnation that is, huh? He says, man, you've done some really cool stuff, Ephesians, but at some point in your journey, in your process, you... You left your first love. So there's a condemnation there. Now let's bring it to a close here with the last three verses. Verses 5, 6, and 7. Look at how verse 5 reads. 
he says to them, remember therefore from when thou art falling. That's where this restoration begins for each and every one of us by simply remembering. How many times did the Lord have to remind the children of Israel during the wilderness journey and even when they went into the promised land, huh? he would always say, remember what it was like in Egypt? Do you remember what it was like in Egypt back in the day? I do. I remember how unfulfilled and how purposeless I felt back in the day. God says, remember. Remember, and that remembrance should lead to something else. Watch this. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and do what? And repent. (laughs) Get back on the trail. Get back to that switchback where he's going to provide more and more revelation so that the journey, so that the, the process of transforming can continue. That's called repentance. Those are the switchbacks in your life and in my life. And it's amazing how he works, man. Embrace or enjoy the switchback, man, because that's where he reveals so, so much. Watch this. Remember, therefore, once thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. What is he telling him to do in that passage? Three, a third R, right? Remember, repent, and return. Just go back to you know what to do. So you went by the wayside a little bit. So what, man? Just get back on the trail, man. Just keep climbing. Let God continue to transform like only he can transform. He says, and do the first works. Go back to what you know to do. Find your purpose, Ephesian believers. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of thy place. If he removes that candlestick, what's the outcome? What's the result in any of our lives? What? Darkness. Darkness. Except thou repent. Verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I love how these folks thought. You're going to see this group mentioned twice in the Bible in the context of the Ephesian believers, the the Ephesian church age, as well as in the Pergamist period. Over here, he mentions the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And in chapter number two, when he starts talking about the Pergamist period, he starts talking about the ways and the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Anybody know who these guys were? Say it again, Michelle? Exactly. Anybody know the religious term that we would give the Nicolaitans today? By the way, the word Nico means conquer. The term Laetin means lady. Conquer the lady. Conquer the common person. And isn't it interesting that the Spirit of God would reveal to the early church, the first church period, don't ever go there. Why? This is the clergy system. This is who they are. Who are going to show up through the rest of church history to control the people. Are you not aware and mindful of the fact that everything that's going on in the world today from a globalist agenda or one new world order or whatever whatever concept you want to impart is all about one thing, control. Control, period. Control your money, control your your life, your movements. And as Klaus Schwab once said in his book, The Great Reset, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. (laughs) That's the agenda. That's the goal. And it starts by these elitists that are above everybody else with the sole purpose of controlling. You know what? Jesus twice here in Ephesians and in Pergamos. Why the Pergamos period? What happened in Pergamos? Much marriage. Are you with me? 
the religious clergy system was finally established and applied to the church. They start having councils, convening councils to tell you what to believe, what to think, and how to think. I don't need them. God gave me his word. Right? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans is what is referred to in Pergamus. And you want to hear something really crazy. The Spirit of God says in that verse, in that phrase in Pergamus, which I hate. Those are strong words. When God hates something, Psalm 711, the Lord says, I'm angry with the wicked every day. Proverbs chapter 6, there's seven things that God hates. God has the ability to hate. There's certain things that he hates. This he really hates because it's revealed to us twice. The deeds and the doctrines of those that want to conquer you keep you dumb, stupid, happy, whatever their motive or agenda is. Why? Knowing the truth will what? Set you free, man. So look at this. But this thou hast, but thou hast hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which, which I also hate. And then he says in the seventh verse, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In other words, you had better pay attention. Those of you that have an ear, you better hear. To him that overcometh, he says, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know what's cool, folks? You have already overcome. There's your position in Christ. Remember John chapter 16, verse 33. Larry, could you throw John 16, 33 up, please? We're going to close with this verse. Because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross, positionally you have been seated on a heavenly place. You know what? You're victors in his eyes. You are a victor. The issue is how do you perceive yourself? Please listen to the last words that Jesus shared with his disciples before he went to the cross. The very last words that he imparts to them. These things have I spoken unto you. What things? Everything that he said in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. All these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. For in the world ye shall have what? You will. You shall have tribulation. Not might, not maybe, not I hope not. Ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer for what? I have overcome the world. You're seated in a heavenly place with Christ. You're an overcomer in his eyes. The issue is, do you perceive your condition matching your position? Ephesians, that's it. Their characteristics. Can you want to see the outline again? Larry, could you all, can you go to the outline again, please? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we are looking at the characteristics, the commendation in verses 2 and 3, and the condemnation in verse 4, and then the last three verses, I refer to it as the conclusion of how he addresses this church. You know what I'll do for your outlines next week? I'll, put, I'll start putting the uh, outline in the outline. How's that? Would that help? Well, it is, isn't it? Arlene, it is. It's your A, B, C, and D, Arlene. Yeah, what? Never mind. I'm not going to do that for you. All right? We have five minutes. We'll take one question. A short one. Donna? All right, does everything make sense? See where we're headed? Keep those three applications in mind moving forward. Historical is the map. Doctrinal is the revelation shirt and then devotionally how does this apply to me man there's a verse a passage in every one of these seven churches that we could relate to right the devotional application is always the most difficult one to live because um yeah 
You have to apply it. Jim McCormick? I have one short story that happened today. Okay. Wow. And the Lord took him. He was very close to his daughter. Two days, two days later, his daughter left. She passed? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And she goes to St. Anthony's Catholic Parish in Pecos. Mm hmm. St. Anthony's Parish did not reach out to her. The priest did not come out to talk to her. Oh, wow. No one cared. No one cared. That stinking Nicolaitan. Yeah. Well said, Jim. In That's really uncomfortable. Yeah. Whether it be death of a child or death of a husband or spouse, it's just heart wrenching. Yeah, and it is. My heart went out to her, and you know, I asked her, I said, Do you still do you blame, do you, do you blame God? She said, No, I pray to God every day. Mm -hmm. I said, Good for you. Awesome. Good for you. I said, The Christian church is with you. Give us, give, give her our number. I, Please do. I, I know yeah. Her about okay. That'll offend you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, for those of you that are disciples, I would challenge you all yeah. to make a purpose to come alongside one person this year that is grieving or is of, of a religion who's, who's hopeless. Mm -hmm. Bless her heart. We'll be we'll be praying for her, Jim. Yeah, give me her name. Yeah, and then we'll we'll be praying for. Her. Here's a really cool, um, just a little follow up to his story. So, um, as we walked Mrs. Trujillo back to her car um, at the at Century Bank in Española, um, I just took a minute and just thanked them and and prayed with them and was very grateful. And I said we would love to have you. Join us on Sunday uh, so you could meet Bridget and Joel. And she, for the daughter, right away said, well, what time? So be praying that they show up because um, two very, very precious ladies. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God, Jim. How much do I owe you for those thoughts, for those words? <laughs> Larry, did you? Where's Sylvia? You're going to write Sylvia. You're going to write you a check. Thank you, Jim. By the way, this is Jim McCormick, who was very, very instrumental in us being able to get in this building. He was the com the president of commercial loans at Century Bank when we were in here. He was a part of our church. He was with us at the Chavez Center back in the day. And uh, Jim and Linda, and uh, three years ago, Jimbo? Jim? Five years ago that you moved? No way. Man, time flies when you have. Anyway, they moved to Williamsburg, Virginia, because they have a son and a daughter that live there. 
And um, Larry and I had the privilege of seeing that go. We went to go visit a couple of years ago. What a neat area. These guys were like 10 minutes from, from Jonestown, from Yorktown, Yorktown, Jonestown. I mean, all this history right in their backyard. And that was a really, that was a really fun trip. And man, it was great to see them. But Jim McCormick and his beautiful wife's name is Lindia. She's already left, right? She's already gone back? Yeah. Yeah. They still have family in Albuquerque. That's why they're in town. Um, their grandson graduated from La Cueva. Yeah, so their youngest grandson still lives in Albuquerque. Arlene? On Saturday, I was here for that CPR class. Uh-huh. And there was two instructors, Edward and Matthew. Mm-hmm. Well, Edward was asking me some questions about the church, so I had Oh, wow. That. The card? Mm-hmm. The card. So I gave it to him, and I asked him the first question, and I mm. just No way. <laughs> Edward, awesome, Arlene. Praise God. Awesome. Yeah. Because I said, I'm going to leave this with you when I want you to read through this. And, this, and he confessed out loud, I believe. Awesome. And then I saw wow. reading through it. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Awesome? Okay. It really is. And, and again, I would encourage you and those of you that have been here a while, we have these blessing bags uh, that we give out to people that are out on the streets in need. And in those bags, besides toiletry stuff and some snacks, we have that gospel track. We have a bunch of them in the back on, I call it Charles's table in the back, the security table. Grab some to keep with you in your car and hand them out to people. And it's unbelievable. You'll never know. But one of these days, we're going to be raptured out of here and we'll get to meet some of these folks that we might have handed a blessing bag to or even just a gospel tract. So praise God. Thank you for sharing that, Arlene. Yeah, that's what it's about. All right, it is 9.01. We, uh, let, did, did we pray? We didn't pray, huh? Man, I promise we're not going to pray to Diana of the Ephesians. But, uh, but um, isn't the Bible awesome, man? How, how relevant it is even to this day. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for, Lord, revealing to us so much about your plan, your purpose um, for our lives. And Lord, for this planet. And I pray, Lord, that as we wait for your return as uh, the bride of Christ, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would stay true and, and focused on uh, the purpose and the mission that you've given the body of Christ. To see the believers perfected and mature for the work of this amazing ministry of being able to reach out to others and ultimately, Lord God, to see the body edified. Thank you for loving us like only you can. And... Um, for affording us the opportunity to love others for your glory. And Lord, we'll thank you and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.